Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our sixth webinar series with our international university partners. Um, I am Nadine Samala Lamasa from the International Relations and Partnerships Office. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank everyone for your time and, of course, your interest in joining this in our session for today, which is in partnership with the Montfort University Leicester from the UK, uh, from the specifically from the Media Discourse Center. So first, I would like to um, welcome our moderator for today, Mr. Rudy Sukandar P. LSPR Center for Research, Publication, and Community Service. Um, Dr. Rudy, are you there? Yes, Nadine, I'm here. Yeah. Oh, we are starting now? Yes. Oh, okay, sorry. I'm just a bit distracted by the voice. I mean, the noise starts now. So, um, hello, everyone. Uh, good day, good morning to everyone in, uh, in England, and then uh, uh, good late afternoon to anyone in Indonesia. Um, a bit of a disclaimer first because my house is very close to the mosque so you will hear a bit of uh, background noise so please uh, bear with me with that. Um, um, having said that I would like to uh, welcome you to uh, LSPR webinar series uh, with International University Partners as uh, Nadine mentioned before that this is um, a cooperation between um, uh, LSPR Communication and Business Institute with the Montfort University from Leicester. Um, today, we are, we are so lucky and honored to have uh, two very distinguished speakers um, who will be sharing on uh, contingency planning on branding, the pandemic resilience, risk and public communication, surveillance and propaganda, and also about the dual purposes of emergency planning. Um, first, I would like to uh, introduce uh, uh, both of our speakers today. Uh, the first one is uh, Dr. Ben Harbisher, a uh, senior lecturer at the Montfort University, Leicester. Um, it's published in, in Critical Discourse Studies, uh, Surveillance and Society, Hard Times, and the Journals for the Study of British Cultures, and also with chapters in edited volumes such as uh, Surveillance in Action, uh, investigative journalism in 2019. Um, his notable works include titles on surveillance and dissent extremism and counter-terrorism policy. Really, really interesting subject and also uh, some of the uh, the topic uh, uh, being uh, uh, researched by Dr. Halbisir happens to be uh, uh, in the same line as mine too. And um, the second uh, speaker is uh, Stuart Price, uh, Professor of Media and Political Discourse and Director of the Media Discourse Center at the Montfort University. Uh, he is a visiting professor at UERJ and UFRJ in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, his publication include four edited books, uh, three textbooks, uh, three monographs, including Worst Case Scenario in 2011 on emergency planning and the uses of security. Uh, a major focus of current research is protests in Spain, while another is in the language of COVID emergency. Uh, in 2015, um, he helped make a documentary on memories of the Spanish Civil War, uh, based on interviews with the families of those who had died during the conflict and the dictatorship which followed. Uh, again, as uh, Nadine mentioned before, my name is Rudy Sukandar. I am the moderator today. I'm the director of LSPR Center for Research, Publication, and Community Service. Hopefully that we will have a very productive uh, discussion in our uh, webinar today. And um, uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please uh, uh, type in, in the, the, the comment section. So uh, um, uh, later then we can just uh, um, um, expand or extend your, your, your question to our speakers today. So I guess um, our speakers will have about um, uh, 20 to 25 minutes to present their uh, um, um, uh, uh, points of discussion today. So I guess without further ado, uh, I would like to start with... Uh, okay, my video is, is gone. All right, uh, I would like to start with uh, uh, Dr. Ben Harbisher. Dr. Ben, the time is yours. Uh, morning. Uh, Salaamu Alaikum, everyone. How are you all? Um, so to put some of this into context for you, really, this is um, uh, Stuart and I have just started on a new academic venture together. 
Um, we are currently working on two brand new edited books together um, with a variety of other publications in the pipeline. So realistically, to some extent, what you're going to be seeing over the course of the next half an hour to an hour is going to be uh, partially some work in progress. It's brand new research that we're currently engaged in. And, uh, and it's, this is quite exciting for us as much as it's exciting, hopefully, for you as an audience, because this is its first public outing, really. So um, if I can, let me just see if I can get this lined up OK. Uh, maybe somebody could tell me whether or not this is on their screens. Uh, Nadine, can you help? Don't forget to press present now, Dr. Ben. Press present now. That should be sharing. How does that look? There you go, yes. Fantastic, okay. So you should be seeing this now. So this is... Um, in part, this is, uh, this is a current strand of research that I'm engaged in at the moment, um, primarily because I'm interested in the way in which the coronavirus epidemic overall has been uh, packaged and branded in the UK. And this seems like a particularly odd sort of line to take in terms of credible academic research into something as important as a global pandemic. Um, but I'm really quite interested in the way that key government messages are communicated to audiences such as the general public. Um, during these times. It's one of the very rare instances in which you can actually see the entirety of the um, techniques and technologies of statehood statecraft actually working away behind the scenes when we have a crisis of this kind of nature. And it's very rare that something like this comes along. I think the last opportunity we had to see the, the true nature of the state perhaps was during 9-11 and the aftermath over the following couple of years. So from a communications perspective in terms of surveillance studies and a broad number of other disciplines, um, this is a really quite unique time to be uh, working in academia. In terms of uh, the introduction to this then, uh, my interests are how advertising and marketing techniques have been used to encourage public compliance to a variety of different initiatives in the UK, primarily the whole stay at home uh, message to, to encourage people not to venture outside and spread the virus, um, how a variety of metrics are used either in government circles or by advertising and marketing agencies um, to monitor the effectiveness of these kind of campaigns and otherwise how the establishment in the UK uses marketing techniques and social media to main con maintain, maintain control. So as a brief insight into the kind of methodology and the tools that I've been using, you may recognise some of these. Um, some of my colleagues, I'm sure, would have used LexisNexis in the past. It's a, um, it's a particular platform that allows you to enter keywords into a search engine and pull up any number of news stories, news articles from newspapers. Um, similarly, Chartbeat is primarily used in the broadcast and news media sector. If anybody's seen this one before, it's a particularly unique platform and it allows you to um, trace the popularity of a given news story. So if you're working in a newsroom, for example, um, it's a particularly useful tool and you can find out how many people are looking at a news story at any given time, what platforms they're viewing it on, whether it's a search engine, whether it's a mobile phone, whether it's a laptop or a computer. Um, where people are going to after they've clicked on these news stories. So it's a very interesting way of, of monitoring what kind of feedback your news article is getting. Similarly, TinEye is something that, um, that my attention was drawn to after a recent Netflix series called um, You Don't Mess With Cats, um, in which a number of online uh, protagonists effectively hunted down a serial killer. Um, this is a very unique tool, and I've used this over the course of this presentation, um, primarily because you can post an image in, into this search engine from the internet, and it gives you a list of all of the websites that it's ever been shown on, and the date it was first, uh, first released on the internet. And I'll explain how I've used this in due course. Other tools that I've used from time to time include the, um, the Wayback Machine. This is another great archiving tool. Um, if you want to find out what a website looked like on the 1st of November in 2008, 
you click on this uh, search engine, you enter in the URL, and it shows you uh, every iteration of that website's um, uh, life cycle. It's very interesting to see what websites looked like a number of years ago. And from a research point of view, it's really useful to use because websites are updated and taken offline all of the time. So um, it's a really useful research tool. Talon um, are a marketing organization. They have some proprietary software called Ada, which I'll talk about in due course. This is a very interesting package that's only just come to the market. And it's useful in marketing and advertising terms for tracking footfall in given geographical areas. So if you want to know how many people have been walking around, say, Piccadilly Square in London, Piccadilly Circus, rather, you can track that footfall using Ada. And this is quite important at this uh, at this given moment in time, because you can place some advertising and marketing material and find out what kind of impact it's had. So in terms of working methodology, these are the kind of tools that I've been using recently. So what I'm quite interested in then is looking at how the government has branded the COVID-19 pandemic in the UK. And over the course of the past couple of months, we've seen a number of different iterations of what one consider a brand, certainly in terms of a logo and a graphical identity, um, to build public confidence in the government, to try and identify um, that the government still has authority and control, and to present somewhere near a coherent and consistent message to the population. Interestingly, each of these designs represents a different political agenda and has been used to signify different things to the audience at various points during the last two months. In other words, this is how language is used to construct meaning and how different values are encoded within a graphical image. And that's really the nexus for what I've been studying over the past few weeks. We're going to start off by looking at something fairly straightforward and fairly simple. So the majority of people in the UK, in fact, everybody in the UK should be aware of this logo. It's been ex in existence since the early 1990s. It was one of Tony Blair's main initiatives as a prime minister back in 1991. To to, to provide our NHS, our, um, our free healthcare service in the UK, with a coherent brand, something that would be instantly recognisable to the majority of the population. And believe it or not, actually, um, actually united over 1,001 disparate different NHS trusts and concerns. So this was a means for branding all of our hospitals and all of our healthcare uh, services. As we can tell from the logo, obviously, this, uh, this utilises a specific colour, it's a Pantone. Um, colour. The colour of blue is supposedly there to symbolise uh, clean cleanliness, um, a clinical approach to whatever the company represents. The typeface is quite clean, it's forward leaning. There's supposed to be, um, it's supposed to symbolise a certain dynamic, forward facing, progressive organisation. So with that in mind, now that we've sort of warmed up and limbered up a little bit and started to think about how organisations are packaged and represented graphically, we can move on to start, um, to start examining some of the political messages that these are used to encode. So right before the start of the, um, the lockdown in the UK, at the start of the pandemic, we start to see the UK government um, presenting its messages through the medium of press conferences. On the left here, we can see um, Chief Medical Officer Chris Whitty, Prime, uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson in the centre of the stage, Sir Patrick Valenso to the right-hand side, our Chief Scientific Officer, during an initial press briefing on the 12th of March. We can see here um, that the graphical representation of this is very clean. It's an inverted form of the NHS logo. It's lowercase, it's sans serif. It utilises the same kind of colour scheme. Primarily, this was used to signify that the government is speaking on behalf of the NHS, that it knows precisely what it's talking about. Although the connotations of this, visit NHS coronavirus for more up-to-date information. They have the most up-to-date information that's available. Nonetheless, throughout all media communications, all forms of media discourse over the last couple of months, whenever you see medical messages represented, they clearly reiterate whatever it is that the government's showing us. In that respect, in popular news discourse, in newspapers, if you're looking at um, Catch It, Bin It, those kind of campaigns, you'll see they're all represented using the same kind of typefaces and same colour schemes. On the 22nd of March, I believe this was Sunday the 22nd of March, you see Boris Johnson take a slightly different 
um, track here and we see the new slogan of protect the NHS get, uh, get introduced for the first time. This in marketing terms is where the strap line of stay home, st save lives, protect the NHS starts to gain traction as it's released to advance the earlier use of the NHS brand. Um, the same swatches and typeface are used again to promote both familiarity and to represent the Prime Minister's expert medical knowledge of the outbreak. And this is also used as a precursor. Um, here we are with a wide angle shot from exactly the same uh, scene. We see um, a triptych of stay at home, protect the NHS and save lives, which effectively is to become the mantra for the entirety of the UK's um, program to combat the coronavirus. And as I say, this is a precursor to what happens the following day on the 23rd of March on the Monday. At 20.30 hours, Boris Johnson orders the population to stay at home, stay indoors, shop only for groceries or essentials, only venture outside if you need to, uh, if you need to find medical advice. This is the start of the UK lockdown. And the point is, this graphic... Um, <clears throat> This graphical campaign is used as a precursor. It's used to soften the blow of the Prime Minister's speech. Here we see the Prime Minister leaning forward um, with his hands clasped in effectively, um, in effectively a posture of sincerity but authority at the same time. We've lost the majority of the branding um, around the PM with the exception of the Union Jack framing the image in the right-hand side, which is supposed to denote a certain sense of... Um, continuity. Um, it's, he's speaking on behalf of the nation. This is how a national address um, is conducted in the UK. Thereafter, all UK mobile networks sent out the first ever national emergency communication to the UK by transmitting an SMS text message stating, new rules are now in force. Stay at home, save the NHS, protect lives. The earlier branding of some 24 hours ago was a prelude to this announcement to soften the blow. And here, the PM has established the strap line offering public sincerity um, in his mode of presentation, PR register, suit and tie. Interestingly, a few days later, we start to see an entirely new uh, variation or iteration of this campaign start to appear here. Michael Gove, MP, Minister for the Cabinet Office, offers an update on the daily press, conf press conference. And what we start to see, this triptych starts to change here. We've got three different colours being used. It uses the colour schemes from the three main political parties in the UK of Labour to the right, the Conservative Party and Liberal Democrats over to the left. And this was a relatively brief attempt by the government to create a coalition of three different political parties to run and manage the entire process. Interestingly, the other two political parties politely declined to form this coalition. If we want to consider, and I know Stuart Price is going to grin about this, the old Barthian notion of uh, mythologies, we can potentially uh, start to look at the connotations, implications, or maybe second order reading of the sign here, and start to analyze what kind of implications the utilization of this color scheme, the placement of these, geopolitical placement of these parties in this logo might represent. To the left, we have Liberal Democrats somehow being told to stay at home after a previous an easy coalition with the Conservative Party 10 years ago. Similarly, we have the Conservative Party taking centre stage, although one could, one could assume that they represent the centre-right in politics in the UK. They embody the NHS, they embody our healthcare system, uh, the entirety of the nation. Here's their current logo, it's, um, it's got the Union Jack flag in it. And over to the right, interestingly, we have the Labour Party situated. One could almost imagine that this would be an uneasy place to situate the Labour logo over to the right of the Conservative Party because it's not a right-wing organisation in any stretch of the imagination. And purely in a hypothetical sense, if we start to associate this in terms of not its placement but connection to the message, actually this is placed here because the majority of the voting population for Labour, one could hypothesise a working class or people from um, uh, the public sector. So we're talking about healthcare workers, we're talking about doctors, perhaps nurses, teachers, and so on and so forth. So the voting demographic for Labour are very clearly being told here to save lives. 
Interestingly, a couple of days later, that part of the branding campaign was dropped in its entirety, mainly because the coalition government didn't form. The other two parties were not interested, but we start to see an entirely new campaign, still with the same strap line, but a slightly different graphical representation of this image, uh, which looks more akin to a warning sign or the kind of vehicle livery that you're going to see on, uh, on, a, on an ambulance, on an emergency healthcare um, vehicle. So we start to see a slightly different representation, um, which is the one that pretty much we stick with for, for a number of weeks after the failed coalition attempt. Interestingly, uh, a couple of branding organisations have started to look at um, analysing, uh, perhaps as with myself, analysing some of these graphics. The earliest one, of course, is simply the, uh, simply the logo for Parliament underneath Boris Johnson here, the NHS coronavirus campaign, the earliest iteration of Protect the NHS, the failed coalition attempt. Here under Michael Gove, we see an earlier version of the final logo that was decided upon, which perhaps was deemed far too subtle before we move into um, a warning sign. If we move on then a couple of um, stages, this one was released on the 10th of May, Sunday last week, and this is the, the current logo now that the UK government has started to step down um, to some degree its lockdown measures and social distancing program. It's supposed to represent a slightly softer approach to this. Um, it's received monumental amounts of criticism through UK media. Um, I'll show you some of the memes later on in this session if we have time for that. Um, so here we have the Sunday Telegraph has reported that Isaac Levido, an Australian communications strategist, and Ben Guerin, a New Zealand digital advisor, have both been working for the Conservative Party during the 19, uh, 2019 election. And they've helped devise a number of slogans, um, the ones that we've previously seen here in the current slogan. Similarly, Murren Lowe and Manning Gottlieb um, are two leading design agencies that have been supporting the government on its communication strategies during the pandemic, but largely in terms of OO and traditional platforms. And we'll talk about OO, well, right now, in fact. So if we're talking about OO, these are um, outside of house advertising campaigns. Here we see one from the Mullen Low Group um, being, being utilised um, in a public space. This is simply a billboard. But the message is really quite clear. It serves to establish a series of normative values. Oh no, not you again, suggests, what are you doing outside when everybody else is sticking to the rules? Unless your journey is essential, stay at home. You have no right to be outside. It's a means for establishing a new normal. And it's quite interesting to see quite how the advertising community have jumped on board with these kind of campaigns. Here we see some further iterations of um, outside of home campaigns. Home campaigns naturally would be the kind of TV commercials that you get um, while you're watching your favourite shows on the television, um, perhaps, uh, or that you're watching on a mobile device or on your laptop um, and so forth. So these are billboards and similar. Here's one encouraging citizens to stay at home for the April holiday. Um, the, the April Bank holiday weekend. And here's one, uh, Piccadilly Circus, I believe, in London. Now, it's quite interesting in terms of measuring impact that the kind of marketing organisations that have been creating these kind of public-facing discourses, um, Talon in particular, um, have been using a variety of <clears throat> data analysis tools, such as the one on the right-hand side of the frame here, uh, which is called ADA. ADA is really quite interesting because it tracks public footfall in a variety of spaces. Therefore, utilising these kind of campaigns and these kind of tools, you can effectively work out whether or not these campaigns work in terms of people are seeing the signs, maybe they're not going out the following day. So over the course of a couple of weeks or so, Talon in particular has managed to track a reduction, a significant reduction in footfall for people in pedestrian spaces. If we move on to social media campaigns fairly quickly, um, again, this is something that uh, Number 10's digital guru, Ben Guerin, have, um, have utilised on platforms such as Twitter, um, either for making corny jokes or featuring strange Photoshop images. Um, here we see one... <clears throat> That, that of course features uh, a number of issues, the NHS, Her Majesty's Government, the strap line at the bottom of the image. 
But the rest of this, from a design perspective, the majority of people would look at twice and say, actually, that's really quite an unpleasant, ugly typeface. It doesn't look right. Why there's so many different colors being used? Why does the per person on the right hand side of the frame seem to have an extra arm here? Where does that come from? These kind of images have been deliberately created to provoke a public talking point. They are deliberately engineered and photoshopped to get people talking about them on social media, sending, to, sending them to their friends and to say, well, hang on a minute, this doesn't look right. This doesn't look right. Why are we actually looking at some of these images? This one I find a little bit interesting, um, primarily because the, the, the whole stay at home campaign uh, stay at home, do some baking. Perhaps this was maybe uh, maybe a bit of an irresponsible campaign that was used, um, because within um, uh, within a couple of weeks or so of the uh, the release of some of these online marketing strategies, all of our supermarkets were emptied of um, of flour. You couldn't buy flour anywhere to bake bread with, so it's a bit of a misnomer, really. However, overall, these these marketing campaigns have specifically been set up to get people talking about them. Now. I'm going to move on to probably one of the final stages of my talk. Um, I think I've maybe got five, six minutes left or so. And what we're really going to start talking about now is nudge. Nudge is something which has been prevalent over the past 10 years in, in marketing terms. Um, it was a concept that was, as you can see on the screen here, coined by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein, who later went on to be senior advisors in the Barack Obama administration in the United States primarily as a result of these kind of theories. So what is nudge? How can we, uh, how can we, uh, how can we define it? Overall, nudge is the, the idea that people can be influenced by a choice architecture into making better choices in their own interests. In political terms, it might follow the edict of dropping an idea into the public domain, such as if you vote for this political candidate, they're going to deliver a number of things that are going to be immediately beneficial to you. Nudge has been used um, during a number of campaigns in the UK, um, nudge analysts, primarily the BIT, the Behavioural Insights team in the UK was established uh, around about 2010, 2011 during Cameron's um, early um, uh, premiership in the UK as Prime Minister. And it's also been instrumental in swaying public opinion for other programmes such as Brexit and is now coming into play again during the uh, during the coronavirus. So it was established by the Cabinet Office in 2010 and is a means of applying behavioural science to public policy. So let's have a look at the kind of things that Nudge actually does. From the um, Behavioural Insights team, who were originally set up in 2010 by David Cameron, and four years later privatised, they now constitute a major multinational institution who are um, who operate throughout the entire Western Hemisphere. So the kind of nudges that they achieved for the UK uh, government during that time include drawing attention to the uh, to those people who fail to pay vehicle exercise duty or rate road tax. If you don't pay your road tax, we're going to send you a picture of your car untaxed and that's going to subliminally or not pressure you into paying your road tax. As a result of this campaign, uh, uh, road tax excise duty increased by I believe about 49% in the space of a number of months. Similarly, by writing to people um, in advance of um, the end of the financial uh, year in April when people are supposed to be submitting their tax returns in the UK by writing to people and establishing a series of social norms everybody else pays their taxes on time why don't you is the kind of normative message these um, these letters send out um, everybody started to increase tax payments and similarly there have been other campaigns run by the BAT, BIT including um, promoting organ donation and increasing fine payment rates through text messaging. In terms of the coronavirus, it's quite interesting to see how the Behavioural Insights team, in other words, the nudge team, have applied um, these kind of nudges in response to the novel coronavirus. Um, for those of you in the UK, you may, you may remember a fairly early um, um, idea posited by um, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, in which he suggested that if you sing happy birthday while washing your hands, sing happy birthday the first couple of verses twice, 
and that's roughly about 20 seconds of time and that's the amount of time it takes to wash your hands and get rid of the virus off them so this is a nudge that was interjected into the public domain similarly another one that i experienced a few uh, a few weeks ago before my local gym closed down was to use alternative or funny handshakes such as um, touching elbows with people this is also something that um, the nudge unit tried to establish as a new social norm if we're moving on to further normative paradigms then and i'll be drawing close to this in a couple of minutes or so um, there's a phenomenon in the UK that started off in places like uh, Spain, Portugal, Italy with, uh, with citizens banging um, pots together to celebrate uh, and provide a sense of community um, in, a slightly, um, <laughs> in a slightly bizarre rendition of the same kind of thing. In the UK we have a small town called Belper in the Derbyshire Peak District and they've started mooing twice a week to, uh, to signify a sense of social cohesion. However, in this case, what we've got is we've we've now got this um, platform called Clapping for Carers in the UK. And once a week at 8 p.m., we're supposed to go outside of our homes and start applauding for all of our healthcare and key workers. So teachers, we're applauding for uh, doctors and nurses, dustbin men uh, and refuse collectors and so on and so forth. It's, uh, it's interesting that this campaign, this nudge campaign has been crafted because it symbolizes a number of things. It's there to celebrate social cohesion, despite the kind of monumental isolation that many of us experienced over the past few weeks. Yet despite a decade of public sector spending cuts and austerity, low wages and appalling working conditions, and indeed burnout for many of our medical providers, the UK government has encouraged this campaign to celebrate the NHS, which is a vital service it's tried to reduce. Clapping promotes social cohesion over isolation. It releases endorphins and provides a distraction from the key issues at hand. The last couple of slides for you here, I'm going to look at, um, in fact, the uh, Clapping for Carers programme even has its own website, which is something that I only found out a couple of days ago. Interestingly, we, um, we draw re relations and associations to the kind of colour schemes and logos and typography that's being used here. Uh, if we draw our attention in particular to the logo on the left hand side, some of you may recognise this. If I jump forward just one screen, um, we can see that there are a certain number of similarities, not just in terms of the earlier NHS logo, colour schemes that are being used, but also in terms of the design of the graphics that are in place here. This is to, again, provide a certain sense of brand continuity. Um, the logo works primarily in terms of uh, familiarity. It breeds familiarity with these colour schemes and existing brands such as the UK National Lottery. Um, in this respect, it symbolises hope. People hope that they're going to become millionaires every time they enter into the National Lottery. It's a charitable service. It invests lots of money into the public sector into other organisations, museums, universities, colleges and so forth. So what we're seeing is that the Clap for Carers campaign is in a sense piggybacking off the success and the establishment of these kind of brands. I'm going to skip to the last slide now because I know that I'm running out of time. What I wanted to show you is one of the um, uh, a number of the memes that have been established um, via social media. If we step back two or three, um, two or three places to Ben Guerin's use of um, social media and Twitter to create uh, viral advertising messaging campaigns, we could hypothesize that these kind of memes that critique the UK government do uh, do something far more insidious. In a sense, they actually perpetuate the brand that's been established, irrespective of whether they're claiming that the government's programme is vague, that it's being used to cover their backs and shirk responsibility. It utilises effectively the same layout, it uses the same colour scheme and breeds familiarity in terms of the new campaign of stay alert that the government are trying to establish. These could entirely be hoax, uh, memes that have been set up online to create a talking point, again, to invest that kind of familiarity into what people are talking about online. So at that point, I'm going to end the presentation, and I think I'm probably going to um, hand over to Stuart at this point. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Excellent.
Okay, I'm just loading this thing up um, and sharing it. Can you see the material yet? Yes, we can see the material. Okay. I can't see the material, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> Encouraging. Um, presenting. Okay. I think you need to click the presentation view. Yeah, I'm just getting down there. Um, All right. Sorry for the delay. Can you see this? Yes. Yes, it works, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what I might do is um, I might flip to full screen at some point, only if I can manage to do it. It may go horribly wrong. I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about the dual purpose of emergency planning. And by that, I mean, I'm going to focus on um, what the state does, very much in the spirit that Ben has already laid out. Secondly, and this is the, the thing I'm going to try and draw together with the first issue about the state and about, um, you know, general issues about communication, is how the COVID event was framed um, I, some of what I've done overlaps, obviously, with what Ben has said, though I may take a slightly different perspective. But I'm going to look mainly at, I suppose, what used to be called mainstream media, one or two bits from Twitter. But I'd like to see how the whole event was kind of put together and framed. So in terms of framing the crisis, what I'm looking at is how formal authority and the UK media characterised the event how it was framed at particular points in time. I'm going to talk also about the way that democracy is expressed through this crisis, um, following Furlbeck, who talked about democracy being the contemporary stamp of political legitimacy. I'm also going to talk very briefly um, in theoretical terms about a concept called systemic democracy, where political entities use electoral mechanisms just to sustain the legitim legitimacy of government and executive authority, but it doesn't need to gain the approval of the electorate for either routine or extraordinary activities. And I think that um, coincides precisely with what Ben was saying. Once you've got your votes in the bag, you can then get on with the idea of acting as an executive. And this idea of executive authority, well, I'll return to this at the end of the presentation to try and tease out this notion I have that we're living uh, in a kind of regime, not just at certain points like a crisis, but the whole time. So, framing. What is framing? Well, Johnson and Noakes talked about this in 2005, and they said it frames um, material much the same way as you get a frame around a picture. You've got a, a, an image and you want to frame it and you want to emphasize certain aspects, just like when you edit one of your photographs, you go on holiday and there's stuff you don't want. It's, oh, I didn't mean to take that stuff. You cut that out. You focus on what is relevant and important. You cut away the extraneous items, the extraneous items from the field of view. Now, that in itself is a political decision. You go on holiday, you take a, a bad photograph, you've got some editorial capability on your phone or your laptop to cut out the bits you don't want. Let me give you an example. Um, a lot of my research work has taken place in Spain. I didn't, unfortunately, take this photograph, though we've got you know years and years of material from protest movements in Spain. But this was uh, a confrontation between firefighters and the police over the issue of anti-austerity campaigning, I think in 2013, but I've got the caption later. So if we're framing this, this is a, you know, this is meant to be a very simple example. 
that if, if you wanted to run a news report, you could frame it in that way. If you if you concentrate on particular events and incidents, that will be the frame through which you understand the bigger picture. Or similarly, if you didn't look at the two firefighters, to give you a very straightforward example, and you looked at police activity, lo and behold, you could frame your news story in that way, cutting out extraneous material. Again, you might take a wider view and give a, a, a better kind of more contextual understanding of what's happening. Now, the next bit, there are bits of theory, of course, in our presentations, but you're welcome to ask questions about particular terms and terminology if you want us to go a bit deeper. Now, 1993, Entman said that media frames construct a message through selection, first of all, and then by the same measure, of course, exclusion. You select some stuff, you exclude others. Then there's the question of emphasis. What do you emphasize? And once you've emphasized something, you elaborate on the thing you've chosen. I think you've seen that very clearly in Ben's presentation. So frames identify problems, establish their causes, they offer moral judgments and recommend solutions. And that's why I think framing is still a highly relevant, useful, important perspective on the mediation of any event. We're looking at crisis, but it could be any, any particular event. Uh, and you can see, I, I saw that in Spain, but that's for another time. So the next thing, selection and exclusion naturally work together. You can't draw them apart. What you select means something has to be excluded. Here you can see, if you look round the, the corner of the yellow um, rectangle, that, that that kind of material is probably not, not particularly uh, germane to the to the work except it cuts out the Catalan flag at the top uh, and of course that's part of the political context of what that demonstration was about. So problem cause judgment solution. Just to reinforce this notion now I'm going to take two perspectives on framing and apply it to the event. So if it's true that um, framing works by identifying problems what is the problem that might be identified in this event? Don't forget, I'm just using the photograph to kind of exemplify, substantiate the event, to refer to it. It's not the whole event, obviously, it's one moment in time. The problem might be violence. There's plenty of newspapers, uh, news media, which will look at, you know, personally peaceful events and decide that the main issue is that you know, at one, for, at one point there was five minutes of brick throwing or violence, so that becomes the headline issue. Um, secondly, the cause, the cause of the violence might be the demonstration. We'd have to, one of the things we've done in Spain is to, to look at how events start. We go at the very beginning and come back at the end when everything is finished to see how media report the timeline. Judgment. The judgment could be it's worker intransigence. That's the problem. Um, the violence comes from the demonstration. It's because, the, you know, um, uh, these firefighters weren't prepared to act reasonably. So the solution would be police intervention. Um, now, if it was the other way around, seen from the anti-austerity protesters in Spain, the problem would be repression. The cause would be the state apparatus, because, as you know, in Europe, I mean, Spain had worse um, unemployment than Greece at one point. Uh, their youth unemployment was 50%. It was just above Greece's unemployment. Um, the judgment would be police brutality and the solution, some form of workers' intervention or control. So these things wouldn't happen in the future. Okay. Firefighters clash. And by the way, the one thing I recommend people to do, to do when you're analysing media is to look at the particular repetition of terms that appear um, in the same context. And whenever there's, you know, even when police have initiated violence, clash is the almost international term that's used to describe conflict between those two sides. So frames enable individuals to locate, perceive, identify and label occurrences within their life space and the world at large. And labelling and framing relates to um, linguistic categorization. Language, 
We're looking at the use of terms that refer to help, refer to or help create divisions between or common resemblances between sets of objects, events, and living things. Now, let me just translate that into, into sort of common sense English. If you're going to label something or some individuals or some event as problematic, then um, you, know, you, you have to speak with some form of authority and you have to be able to demonstrate that you recognize the similarities between people and the differences. Now, for example, I would imagine that a lot of the people um, looking at this webinar at the moment are, are students, whether they're master students or postgraduate, undergraduate. I, I don't know how it works with LSPR, but that's what I would imagine. So I could categorize the audience almost entirely in one way and use that category to address those people in the same way, for, you know, for whatever reason I chose. That wouldn't actually recognize the subtle divisions between people, you know, gendered identity, age, class background, occupation, and so forth. But this is how categorization works. Um, objects, it's part of our foundational belief in, 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 you know, like tables are tables, chairs are chairs. Events are always contested. And of course, when you label living things, which is going to be the central part of what I look at today, when you label people, when you address people, when you speak to people, when you unite or divide people from afar, from outside their own experience, that's controversial. So let's have a look at these. I, I, I chose these vases over here. It's based on a, it's not an original idea. It was based on uh, uh, work on categorization that came out years ago. But all those things on the left, you can probably agree, um, uh, look the same in the sense that they have a family resemblance. Some are longer, some are shorter, but none of those things look like cups, right? One might look like a jug more than a vase, and, but it doesn't matter. We've got a continuity, so it's not controversial. They're vases. You can put, actually, it's got some strands of grass in one of them, so that kind of helps us understand what it is. So it's not really controversial, though some philosophers would say that's the beginning of controversy. Now, when it comes to categories of people, we're in a different situation. This is a photograph I took on a Spanish demonstration, uh, the feminist general strike in 2019. And these were young school students, uh, 14, 15, uh, didn't have most of them the, the, the vote yet. And yet they were part of a militant demonstration calling for women's rights. So in one sense, um, these are all the same types of people. These are kind of uh, young women demonstrators, you could say. On the other hand, although they may share some commonalities of experience and identity, there are divisions between them in terms of, say, for example, uh, ethnic identity within Spain as a whole, within the Iberian Peninsula. So when it comes to people, labeling people, let me emphasize this, is more controversial. Uh, so it's socio-political framing. We're going to look now at framing events and framing people. So when I take the glass of water, that's water, not vodka or anything like that, just pure water. So um, we go from framing uh, uh, events and framing people. We're going to start with this section here, the outbreak, the coronavirus outbreak. How is this framed? Here's an early category from January um, this year. It's a mysterious illness. No illustrations. Those are awful, frightening illustrations of the coronavirus with the spikes coming off it that seem to infest every news article that we see on, on TV. This, this hasn't been thought of yet because there is some genuine uh, attempt to understand what's going on. So it's a mysterious illness. Then, of course, as Ben has pointed out, you get the development over time of explanations, these kind of socio-political explanations for why things are as they are 
or why those in authority want us to read things in a certain way. Here's an early February account of the outbreak. Deadly Wuhan flu. Coronavirus is accompanied by the informal term, Wuhan flu, in inverted commas. So we know that the Daily Express, which is not a terribly good newspaper, is nonetheless able to stand back from its own description and attribute Wuhan flu to another source. The UK Health Secretary, by the way, um, at the time, I know all this stuff is, a lot of this is uh, UK, but um, you know, that, that, that's where we're starting. The work we're doing that Ben mentioned is, 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 is global, internationally based material, just like the last book we produced, uh, Journalism Power Investigation, last year, which was firmly on the global journalistic activist side of things. But, you know, we're doing what we we're doing the UK for the moment. The UK Health Secretary said our world cast NHS is well prepared to manage these types of incidents. And again, as Ben mentioned, you know, that it's, it's, it's a dire situation, the National Health Service in the UK. Um, and one of our uh, colleagues in the centre, uh, her research is about just how deeply privatised the system is. But then, of course, you, you do get a kind of consensus. And when you get kind of outliers or, um, you know, those individuals who think they're above the common order of discourse, who want to speak in whatever way they feel, like Donald Trump, um, they feel free to think, you know, say things like Chinese virus. It's not racist at all, he says. Um, well, you know, if, if you attribute to a particular place, it's not necessarily helpful in understanding um, you know, the global implications of the spread. But anyway, you know, Donald Trump is, is Donald Trump. Um, in addition, he had to address this other remark. One of his friends talked about Kung flu, which he thought was very funny and amusing. And again, um, Trump believed that he, he always says, you know, he's 100 percent something he attributes. He's a great uh, he's a great expert on attribution. He's always saying this is much better than this has been. We're now in this situation and 100% um, Asian Americans agree, 100% with him using the term Chinese virus. And he, he didn't really, he couldn't really defend the Kung flu remark, so he kind of pushed it to one side. So Chinese virus is controversial in official discourse, but Kung flu is impossible to assimilate into any respectable conversation. You know, you could talk about the Chinese virus and someone would correct you. Talk about Kung flu and someone is, you know, it's so stupid that it lays outside the, the realm of acceptable discourse, which is a research uh, in itself. So there are disagreements over terms, disagreements over the simple description of events. That's important to realise. The very simple description of events. There are disagreements over that. Then differences emerge over principles, the political, moral stances and attitudes of various social forces, individuals, groups, formal institutions. So the problem for those in authority, I think that, you know, Ben was explaining this very eloquently earlier, is, is how to, to, you know, address an audience and to make some resonance in the audience. You could see from his presentation how the government had to fine tune their address until it, they thought it hit the mark. So here we go. This is the bit I believe is very com controversial, is framing people and their behaviour. Now, this relates to the lockdown that Ben was talking about, which the UK government was very surprised that people kept indoors, by and large. They were like, oh, my God, they've actually done what they're told. Um, but there were little bits of behaviour which entered the news in order to demonstrate undesirable modes of um, um, public behaviour. A woman had punched a nurse and spat at security officers. Um, the police had to turn up. This is a story in the mirror from um, 5th of April. Under lockdown in the UK, um, we began to see these terms and phrases. And what happened was that they leaked into the common order of the language. Everyone started to talk about them in different contexts vulnerable people, um, herd immunity, a quasi-behavioural scientific term that everyone started talking about, ramping up production, 
that's one thing you you probably won't notice um, in in your um, national context uh, and regional context. But we had endless references to ramping up things until it, you know, almost became meaningless. Ramping up means obviously increasing production. Self-isolation, you know, that's what we academics thought we were doing anyway, so no biggie. Following the science, it turned out the government occasionally meant following the behavioural science and not, you know, clinical issues. Messaging, it's interesting, again, from what Ben said, that messaging as a concept is meant to be a background concept. You talk to other uh, members of, um, you know, the nudge unit about messaging, but it's leaked out into the public and, of course, lockdown. So sets of terms or phrases become the accepted way of understanding what an event means. They offer what appears to be a simple de description of an occasion, but at the same time might also dominate the perceptual field. So simple terms, simple phrases, simple words start to categorize or define the next set of experiences, which may be entirely different. So we had the language of authority. They used quasi-scientific terms, herd immunity, behavioral tropes, social distancing. Social distancing became a verb, you know, I'm social, you know, to social distance became a verb. Authoritarian propositions about like lockdown, well, people would start to say, I'm in lockdown. You know, it's just that, that it's not come from, you know, the population, it's come from authority. So police began to categorise behaviour, and this became a bit of a national joke. Police clearing sunbathers from a park, telling them that a lockdown is not a holiday. Well, you know, lots of people it wasn't a holiday, but for many others that's exactly, you know, that's the only holiday they've got probably. Um, framing the crisis again, Britons continued to flout coronavirus lockdown rules by sunbathing. So sunbathing became like an illegal activity for which you could be fined. The problem of social control is how to get actors to comply with society's rules. Now, when the government was, you know, surprised or astonished about UK citizens behaving themselves, I don't think they should have been because uh, my reading of this is that the UK is basically a very conformist culture in many ways. Um, so society's rule. Framing the crisis, I won't go through everything Young says on the left, but um, it's about rule, laws, moral standards. And um, this, this particular trope or this particular discourse, this point of view uh, got repeated and this was it. Uh, the small minority of people who are breaking the rules or pushing the boundaries, you're risking your own life and the life of others and you're making it harder for us all. Now, I'm not denying that there's truth in that. I think, you know, the messaging and the behavior was more consistent uh, in the first earlier phase than it is now. Everyone is saying that. But I'm looking at the way in which a particular conception of a minority spoiling things for the majority starts to enter public discourse. Um, so here we go. He, go, he talks about toughening up, pushing the boundaries, and you get this on Twitter. The minority always spoil things for the majority. Uh, well, you're just repeating, you know, you're just repeating what the health secretary has said. Um, as always, the minority ruin it for the majority. I always think myself the majority ru ruins everything for the minority, but, you know, that's another story. Um, so an element of... Uh, uh, um, the population seems to welcome more dr draconian measures, supposedly, whether they're generated by bots in Russia, I don't know. So a minority is blamed. I call these social parables. If you read religious texts of any sort, um, certainly in Christianity, you get the parable. In other words, um, a, a religious figure will talk about uh, a kind of story or myth that we're meant to take on board and use that to illustrate good or bad behavior, a kind of social parable. And that's the chapter I'm writing currently for um, one or two publications. Is this social parable being used to distract attention from government shortcomings? Because it didn't work, because the lack of personal pr protective equipment in the UK became, you know, it was, it was out of control. So I'm going to talk briefly now in the last section 
um, in the last few minutes, I hope, uh, about the representation of health workers, because suddenly they were under focus. The rumour now is in the UK that the government is going to try to institute a, um, what do they call it, a pay freeze. Well, health workers and other frontline workers and essential workers have been under a pay freeze during austerity. So this seems quite curious. But anyway, they were turned into heroes. There were doctors on, online complaining that if we had the right equipment, you wouldn't need heroes. But this became a kind of uh, meme or, or uh, um, so, somewhere to kind of hide some of the problems, really, calling them heroes. But on occasion, they didn't behave like heroes. They behaved like industrial workers, like the firefighters I showed you at the beginning. This is an intensive care unit, St. John's Health Centre, Santa Monica, California. And you can see from the gestures that the um, nurses are making that this is a political demonstration inside an ICU, which sounds almost unbelievable because, you know, why would, you know, that these are meant to be the obedient kind of heroic figures who sacrificed themselves. Well, they didn't. Uh, ten nurses were suspended for refusing to work without the proper masks. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a very interesting debate about workers' rights under any condition of emergency, what's meant to happen to workers' rights. So we had these, these competing categories, and it became a kind of, it's still going on. Um, it's something that no one, I think, can control. Health workers, essential workers, Health workers were doctors, nurses, care workers. Essential workers were delivery drivers, shop workers, and doctors, nurses, health care workers. So the divisions between suddenly what were essential, you know, there the, the were jokes in the press about, well, it turns out that, you know, uh, people working in, in, you know, for major companies, CEOs aren't essential after all. So the focus was on the working class. So what were these people? Strikers, militants, heroes? Are they no longer heroic? Now they've gone on strike or they've been suspended. And of course, as Ben quite rightly mentioned, the clap for carers. Um, please spread the word. And um, the thing about banging pots and pans, by the way, that the British do, they've taken that behavior from you know Latin America, Spain, and other countries, where banging the pot and pan is actually a, a, a a sign of disapproval. People, my colleague uh, Fernanda Amaral out in Rio de Janeiro at the moment reports people banging uh, pots and pans on their balconies in order to show disapproval for Bolsonaro's suicidal approach to the coronavirus. But it's quite a widespread event. People come out of their houses and clap. And, you know, this was uh, the police got into slight trouble because further down the row, they'd forgotten to observe social distancing. But, you know, everyone's meant to get together in a show of national unity. This woman was very interesting indeed. She's the one who demonstrated on her own a pregnant um, doctor uh, saying that clap for carers is a distraction. She, she single-handedly demonstrated outside Downing Street. And increasingly that, that other people began to talk about it. A distraction, she didn't say this, but some other, uh, another doctor did, a distraction from the big issues behind the crisis. If they're clapping, they can't hold protest pla placards. Um, designation equals categorization. So there are lots of people in the NHS who don't want to be called heroes. They're modest, but also, um, you know, they think it distracts from the point. There should be no heroes in healthcare. Now, Here's the, as I move towards the, I keep promising to, to finish, which is like, <laughs> please, please finish. Um, but do, I am genuinely moving towards some kind of conclusion. This particular anonymized doctor said, um, found it difficult to see Boris Johnson praise the NHS. I don't know if you know what happened. He got very sick. He was saved by these two nurses. One was from New Zealand. One was from Portugal, and um, previously in conservative discourse, we've had a lot of stuff about the exclusion of people who don't fit their idea of what it means to be British. Um, I'm going to skip over some of this, but I am going to say that one of my central arguments is the state has to provide a rationale 
for people's continued objectification. People are, you know, you get stuff about refugees and it's often that they're unproductive. Or you get stuff about, you know, uh, British brawn and b bread and they're meant to be kind of the productive, decent citizens. Then there's another group uh, years ago, um, single mothers suddenly replaced, uh, you know, uh, terrorists as the main e enemy, it seemed. There were so many um, stories about single mothers sponging off the state. So that's what something I, I said in 2016 and I adhere to, that the state always gives a rationale for objectification. So there's the press conference. Ben has talked about this, so I won't go into too much detail, but it was definitely, you know, you're going to kill people if you go out. Stay alert, control the virus. And as Ben said, you've got parodies. Uh, the parody may help. I think he's correct in, you know, kind of drawing attention to or recirculating the original form. But at the same time, um, uh, the, the actual language here, which is what I'm looking at primarily, is unambiguous. It's like get to work and, you know, die. Commuters in England may fail face lethal consequences, blah, blah. Um, and I'm probably going to end on this. There's a bit more. I've got, you know, probably 10 more slides, but I think it's better if I talk about the rest of it if there's questions, because my main thesis here is that um, the whole system is, is kind of dual purpose. On the one hand, um, it's correct. The, the state has to intervene during crises, but it always does it for a second reason, which is uh, reinforcing its own power over citizens. And it's the denial of full social rights to subaltern groups. It means the class of subordinates is always available to underwrite the failures of the economy. Right, I'm going to stop there and I hope go back to Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ben and Professor Stewart. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, um, questions, actually. Not a couple, um, uh, actually, list of questions. But um, but also, I need to acknowledge that we get um, uh, several questions from the audience. And then, uh, but before we uh, uh, turn into questions from the audience, I'd like to ask a couple of questions regarding your presentation. I think the first question is uh, for Dr. Ben. Is this regarding your presentations that uh, this is about the campaign? And, I would like to know about public resistance toward the campaigns. Have have you uh, uh, noticed any um, any uh, resistance from the publics uh, regarding the campaign made by the state and also by the private sectors? Uh, I can give you an example uh, in Indonesia. For example, we got lots of uh, resistance from the public regarding the uh, the state campaign for people to stay home. For example, they base their resistance on. Uh, religious reasons, for example, so uh, worship houses must not be uh, uh, worship houses must must not be closed, for example. So they keep uh, going to the uh, the house of worship, for example, and then not really paying attention to the government uh, and also the, the the state's campaign that they need to stay home. So the questions for Dr. Ben is about public resistance. If you have ever uh, uh, um, uh, uh, noticed that uh, after the campaign is done. Uh, the second question is for Professor Stewart. Is this regarding um, your framing? Um, um, my question is, uh, is this more fundamental, I think, in terms of the question? My question is, how free is the state and media in framing in terms of crisis, like uh, the situations right now in COVID-19 crisis? Uh, how, how free do you think the state and, and media can, can do the framing? Um, because we have this uh, freedom of expression uh, versus public safety, for example. Do you think that they have to be in the opposite uh, uh, position so they can basically can be uh, uh, synchronized um, between the freedom of expressions and also the public safety? So um, I might turn to, uh, uh, to Dr. Ben first to, to answer my questions and then go to Professor Stewart. Dr. Ben, go ahead. Thank you very much. That's, um, that's actually an incredibly complex um, question to respond to for a number of reasons and um, primarily what I'll say to this is if you look at the general uh, mainstream popular consensus at the moment in the UK the authorities are trying to manage 
um, the general public in such a way that it's almost becoming unconventional or undesirable for people to speak out about um, any kind of dissent towards the lockdown, coronavirus and these kind of issues. So on the one hand, if we look at the emergency legislation that was brought in two or three weeks ago, um, I believe it was the COVID-19 2020 legislation, effectively what's happened is we've banned people from gathering in public spaces and almost immediately this reduces the general population's capacity to dissent, to protest, to gather en masse, to realistically fight or campaign against anything that they don't like happening. And that's really quite a significant thing to take into consideration. What we do have to question is to what extent these particular types of legislations are going to be relinquished, uh, repealed, released at the end of our period of lockdown, or whether some of these measures are going to be with us for a very long amount of time. Similarly, we also need to question the kind of um, uh, systems and strategies that the authorities have, say, for instance, the, um, uh, the intelligence machinery of the UK through the, uh, through the police, through organisations such as GCHQ, Government Communication Headquarters, MI5, the Domestic Intelligence Agency, all have a role to play in monitoring these kinds of popular dissent that may start to emerge. There are a very small number of organisations who are starting to campaign against the lockdown, although very quickly the majority of these are being pushed um, in government discourse, in authoritative discourse towards the right. Some of them justly so. There was a, uh, uh, a rally that I shared with um, Professor Price just yesterday evening that's taking place in Nottingham, which poses to be almost a, a left-wing um, countercultural kind of, hey, let's get together, play some music and, uh, and talk about how awful the lockdown is. But actually, when you start to look at the organisations behind this particular rally, it's almost the, uh, a, a novel version of the English Defence League, um, the EDL, which is a very right wing, almost supremacist kind of institution. So it's, it's interesting that on the one hand, the, the political right, the extreme right, is starting to gather momentum in some cases. And the left largely has been relatively quiet so far. Um, there have been a number of campaigns and protests around the UK. Um, there was one I was reading about just two days ago where, where a group of people gathered on the banks of the Thames near Parliament um, started to exercise because they were missing access to public gyms. So there are different types of dissent that are starting to appear, which is quite an interesting vein to study. I don't know if that answered your question, uh, Rudy. Thank you very much. You did answer my question, especially looking at the dissent among the public, for example. Yeah. Thank you very much. Professor Stewart? Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to be quite brief. So you were asking about how free the state and media are. Obviously, they're not, uh, you know, they're not absolutely identical in terms of their, their motivations, how, how free they are to kind of exercise their powers to address people. Well, the whole point about public or other intimate forms of address is to, to make an impact, you have to have, understand something about the psychology and interests and, and preferences of your um of your audience if you don't if you don't get that then you're not going to be able to you know build that into your mode of communication so they build it in but they're never really sure about what is going to you know uh, uh, grip onto the public or take hold um as to freedom of expression i mean well public safety freedom of expression going back to what ben was saying that i noticed there is a kind of big left-wing online kind of gathering uh, i think tomorrow this weekend the people's assembly about all this stuff but interesting the left has been absolutely solid more or less about despite their differences agreeing that the lockdown not spreading the virus it if you don't have immunity and you don't have um testing proper testing and you don't have anything like um a proper um, you know, antibody and the rest of it, you can't get inoculated. The only defence that the working masses have got, if you want to call them that, is to is to maintain the stricter form of 
non into you know keep social distancing and the rest of it so that's interesting uh, you can see in the right in, in in trump's america there's a lot of very right-wing people who've come out and have not observed social distancing and now of course 10 days later there's a spike of infection there because as one doctor said you're looking at one mountain you're looking at a, a mountain range 15 mountains stretching into the distance so um, the left is getting to grips now, I believe, with, you know, the contradiction they find themselves in. But um, their opening at the moment is how absurd the, the government messaging is at the moment. It's, it is absurd, the message. Whereas previously, as Ben showed you, it was at least clear. Okay, thank you very much. Now, I'm, I'm turning to questions from our audience. The first one is uh, from Ms. Laila Tuzuria from uh, the State Islamic Institute of Tulungagung, East Java. Uh, she's asking, uh, it seems that the number of people who are sick because of the fear of COVID-19 is more than people who are sick due to COVID-19 infections. So uh, the question is, how do we build good communication? How? Oh, sorry, let me just change the question. How do you build good communication in your country to reduce the fear of COVID-19? So the question is, what is the campaign to reduce the fear of, of, of getting uh, COVID-19? Uh, uh, any of you is, is welcome to answer this question. I'll, I'll, make, I'll make one brief comment and then hand straight to Ben. Um, I, I don't think they tried to reduce fear in the initial phase. They, I think they tried to instill fear and now they've tried to pretend that that like suddenly it's a handbrake turn. It's so quick. Suddenly there's nothing to worry about. I exaggerate for effect, but I think that's what's happened in the UK. Ben. Thank you. I think I would completely agree with that. I think the first phase of the government's um, entire branding campaign around this was to generate fear rather than to reduce it um, because they want people to stay at home. They don't want the population roaming the streets, infecting one another. It's literally a divide and conquer kind of campaign to say, go home, stay there, um, stop spreading the virus. This is, this is really the first part of the campaign that we've seen. Um, it's interesting that Stuart mentions the notion of the U-turn here. Um, a political U-turn is something that we're quite, I wouldn't say fond of, but very used to in UK political terms. Um, if you look at the political campaign, the branding, the placards that I showed earlier on this morning or this afternoon for you, um, what you'll see is that whereas normally we're used to, uh, say, a red, amber, green kind of strategy, and most of our communication discourses in terms of traffic light systems, red being the most extreme form of danger, amber, that reduces through to green. Ostensibly, Boris Johnson has come under a substantial amount of criticism for um, the later campaign, the Stay Alert uh, platform that was released on the 10th of May, because green is go. Effectively, it's not stop and take care and be conscientious of what's happening around you. Green is go. It would have been more appropriate for there to have been an amber alert in place, which mm -hmm. thereafter corresponds with the, uh, with the traffic light system that the government's trying to impose, the warning system. That they're trying to impose for, for the uh, coronavirus in the UK. So as, as far as the response to the, um, uh, the delegates concerned goes, uh, there hasn't been a campaign to reduce fear. There's been a campaign to promote fear in the UK because that's how the government has secured control over the population. There may be, in due course, uh, a, a softer campaign to encourage people to start going back to work. But at the moment, it's very much an open playing field. Thank you very much. Uh, the second question is from uh, Wulan Yulianti from LSPR Jakarta. Wulan wants to know how your university, the Montfort University, manages and communicates the foreign students during the pandemic. Uh, the next question is, since every sector has faced uh, a lot of risk and crisis because of the pandemic, uh, how does the educational sector make recovery with good branding when the pandemic ends? That's a fascinating question that in reality I should be passing over to our branding and marketing department 
because I don't have an answer to that personally. What I will say is that the university sector worldwide is going to struggle very much with um, with the aftermath of the uh, coronavirus, not just in terms of um, brand continuity or marketing, but certainly in terms of the logistics of how we deliver our programs. Um, in America, a number of universities have now um, have now transformed to purely online delivery of their programs. At De Montfort University, we are now starting to explore options for either online delivery only from October forwards or for blended learning, which will combine online and face-to-face -face delivery. But much of this relates entirely to what we're legally going to be allowed to deliver from September and October forwards. We might not legally be in a position where we're allowed to have students on campus or certainly more than 10 people in a classroom at a time. We yet don't know how this is going to be managed by the establishment and by the British state, let alone how this is going to filter down to the university sector. So it's a very problematic question to try and answer. In terms of um, business continuity, we are trying to, to organise the continuity of all of our courses, all of our degree programmes, uh, whether they're going to be delivered online or based, based in due course. Yeah. yeah. Um, should I say a couple of things as well? Yes, yeah, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Um, yeah. In answer to that question, it's quite interesting being involved um, with management inside institutions across the UK because um, a lot of the stuff, the drive for safety, the plans for safety are coming from the trade unions inside these institutions, uh, in part because management as Ben hinted, tend to wait for government instruction. So um, the last time we had an issue um, with the union, the union took action on this issue in March. Uh, I think it was, um, yeah, five days before management did. So it's always the people on the ground that are, uh, uh, are able to see what, what is needed in terms of distancing, in terms of micro timetabling, in terms of blended learning and the rest of it. And it's the same with the security regime in any country. Um, but the idea is that uh, first responders used to be just, um, you know, like the police, the fire service, but the term first responder has come to mean citizens as well, because often it's them who are at the, the sharp end. As for branding, I think it's a very interesting question because, you know, this is something you can't kind of brand your way out of. The coronavirus has got its own brand. They keep promoting a coronavirus brand with that spiky monster on television all day long. So it's difficult for universities to know. When you've got things like MIT in the States offering free, high-quality online courses, then you know, this requires other people to come up with what used to be known as a USP. You remember? Unique selling proposition. Some people call it the unique selling point. Well, um, a lot of people are going for the same USP. That's not the way to do it. Um, I've got, I taught advertising for maybe 14 years. So I've got an idea about what I would do. But at, at the moment, I'm convinced that the people on the ground inside the universities are the resource that universities are going to need. But of course, universities across the world are thinking about downsizing their staff because they think they can put stuff online. But the branding question is very interesting. You can't brand your way out of it. You, you can, you, one basic brand you can have is the absolute truth. That would attract people, but not many institutions really want to do that. Thank you. It's quite interesting on how COVID-19 has uh, already has its own brand on this. Um, let me just turn to uh, the third. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the next question is from Ms. Uh, Candy Hernandez from LSPR. This is question for Professor Stewart. Can we say that this pandemic is just caused by infodemic? We talked about infodemic a couple of weeks ago in our own research at LSPR. Did we just ac actually miss uh, the frame, uh, uh, framing the coronavirus? Go ahead. Um, I think it's, it's, that's a fascinating question because that question relates to something that we have to think about all the time, which is the relationship between, on the one hand, what we take to be reality, okay, 
this thing is, you know, dangerous. And on the other hand, how we talk about it. And almost, I suppose, the, you know, the idea behind the question is almost expand its importance exponentially. As soon as the WHO, the World Health Organization, WHO, said, um, oh, well, look, here you go. This, now, this is now a pandemic. It, it assumes a different um, 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 kind of frame. So that there, there, is a, an, there is an infodemic, maybe. But on the other hand, um, this infodemic is not consistent. It's not the same consistent message. So I would say in, in response to that, it's a, it's a very interesting question about you know, reality and language. Because I think the point is, the vast majority of the world's population, if they catch it or they... You know, they're not going to get, but if you get really ill, you're in, it's very, very dangerous. So the relatively, I'll give you one, I know Ben wants to come in, just one quick point. 2017 to 2018 in the UK, there were 50,000 excess deaths, which doctors attributed to austerity, poverty, um, you know, bad diet, smoking. But also the fact was that the instrument that killed them was flu seasonal flu very i i had it 2017 2018 it was really severe um but it did not make the headlines in the same way there wasn't a running count that's fifty thousand people wiped out um you know probably less than this thing's going to do but you know that it's a fascinating question reality and language dr ben Thank you. Sorry, I was just looking very quickly for something online, but I can't find it offhand. There is um, the, the whole concept of fake news and misinformation is a particularly interesting one in the UK. And a more cynical person than myself might suggest that the, uh, the authorities have been very uh, astute in the UK at trying to reduce any kind of, one may put it, popular dissent towards the... Um, towards the lockdown by closing down the majority of social media channels to public dissenting discourse. And what I mean by this is that the, uh, the uh, government has established a new policing task force effectively <coughs> to, to police social media and to try and remove from it fake news and conspiracy theory. Only over the past week or two, we've seen a popular conspiracy theorist in the UK <clears throat> whether or not his ideas are appropriate, right or otherwise, is um, is a matter for personal interpretation. But certainly figures like David Icke in the UK have had their social media channels completely removed and taken offline for spreading disinformation about, <clears throat> say, for example, the use of um, 5G telecom masks to spread the coronavirus or the coronavirus was deliberately started by a variety of different political actors. These kind of conspiratorial voices are increasingly becoming criminalised in the UK with fairly severe repercussions for the protagonists that put them forwards, like the removal of their entire social media um, um, platforms. So it's quite interesting in terms of disinformation that there is a concerted campaign from the authorities in the UK to remove anything which does not represent the mainstream political angle on this. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, we're almost uh, done with uh, our session today. And I would like to invite uh, our audience to thank our uh, speakers today, Dr. Ben Harbisher and Professor Stuart Price from the Montford University, Leicester, UK. Now I'm handing uh, this over to Nadine. Uh, um, Nadine, are you still here? Yes, Dr. Rudy. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you to our moderator, Dr. Rudy, and of course, to our guest speakers, Dr. Ben Harbisher and Professor Stuart Price. Um, I just have one request before the other participants will go offline is to uh, may I request everyone to open your video so that I can get a screenshot of all our viewers <laughs> who attended this webinar for today. It's okay if you're on bed, it's okay, whatever you're wearing right now, it doesn't matter because we're all at home. So please do, please, please open your videos right now and we can get a screenshot of everyone. 
And thank you very much for the invitation as well. We're, yes, we both appreciate pleasure. the ability to start talking about our research. It's endlessly helpful to us as well. So thank you. Yes, thank you as well. Okay, I believe everyone is already. Okay, there you go. I can see everyone. All right, please smile. One, two, three. One more. Okay. Uh, one, two. There you go. Okay, there you go. Again, uh, on behalf of LSPR, we would like to thank our guest speakers and of course our moderator. Good morning to the participants who are in the UK right now and good afternoon and good evening to those who are in other parts of the world who decided to join us this afternoon here in Jakarta. And um, for those, uh, just a simple uh, announcement for those who wanted to have an e-certificate for this session, especially to LSPR students who tuned in in this seminar, please um, send, uh, I will type in the email in our chat box where you can send a screenshot as a proof of your attendance in this session. So I will uh, send the email there in the chat box, so please wait for that. And um, again, um, we hope that we have another uh, series um, with our international uni university partners after the Ramadan season, and that will be in June. I hope the Montfort University, specifically Dr. Ben and Professor Stewart, and of course our moderator, Dr. Rudy, can join us again for that uh, second part of our webinar series. And again, thank you for joining. Um, we will be posting our last uh, session for this you can see in your screen right now, our last session is a sharing session with our foreign students and an Indonesian student who is actually stuck um, abroad right now, which is an LSPR student who is taking their exchange program in Denmark. So as you can see, um, they will be talking about uh, challenges while studying abroad during a pandemic. So. We're looking at students who wanted, you know, are planning or interested to study abroad on what to expect. And just in case there will be another pandemic, I hope there's none, but just in case, you know, um, issues like this or um, incidents or whatever kind of challenges that a student, that uh, a foreign student would, you know, possibly experience, we will be um, sharing that. Uh, tomorrow uh, at 4 p.m. same time. All right, again to our guest speakers and to our moderator, thank you again for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for hosting us. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thanks again. Salamat berbuka puasa, Dr. Rudy. Yes. I already did. Are you ready? I got it? that five minutes ago, so. Oh, God bless. I have my uh, uh, ice water, so. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, thank so you. Much. So uh, I'll, I'll see you later, right? Yeah, okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah. See Have you, a Dr. Good night. Ben, Dr. Stewart. Dr. Ben, bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Bye.